Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Melissa, and I'm your conference facilitator today. I would like to welcome everyone to Cleveland Cliff's full year and fourth quarter 2023 earnings conference call. All lines have been placed on mute to prevent any background noise. After the speaker's remarks, there will be a question and answer session. The company reminds you that certain comments made on today's call will include predictive statements that are intended to be made as forward-looking within the safe harbor provision protections of the Private Security Litigation Reform Act of 1995. Although the company believes that its forward-looking statements are based on reasonable assumptions, such statements are subject to risks and uncertainties that could cause actual results to differ materially. Important factors that could cause results to differ materially are set forth in reports on Forms 10-K and 10-Q and news releases filed with the SEC, which are available on the company's website. Today's conference call is also available and being broadcast at clevelandcliffs.com. At the conclusion of the call, it will be archived on the website and available for replay. The company will also discuss results excluding certain special items. Reconciliation for Regulation G purposes can be found in the earnings release, which was published yesterday. At this time, I would like to introduce Celso Gonsalves, Executive Vice President and Chief Financial Officer. Good morning, everyone. Before discussing our 2023 results, I'm going to start this call by briefly addressing our recent involvement in the U.S. steel sale process, and then I'll clarify our M&A strategy and capital allocation priorities going forward. Just so everyone's on the same page, Cleveland Cliffs is referenced as Company D, as in Delta, in the proxy statement filed by U.S. Steel last week. On December 18, 2023, U.S. Steel announced its intention to sell the entire company to Nippon Steel of Japan and indicated their expectation to close the transaction by Q2 or Q3 of 2024, following a brief customary regulatory review process that was characterized by the U.S. Steel CEO as having, quote, a low level of risk. As we all know by now, these were just a few of many severe misjudgments made by the U.S. Steel board their management team, their lawyers at Millbank and Wachtell, and their financial advisors at Barclays and Goldman Sachs. A deal is only a done deal when it closes, and recent reports make it clear that their announced transaction with Nippon faces a very uncertain path to close, so their saga is not over. Cleveland Cliffs is the only company with recent experience in successfully closing acquisitions involving USW-represented iron and steel-making assets. We did it twice in 2020 when we bought AK Steel and AMUSA, one of which was a whole company transaction and the other of which was an acquisition of certain USW represented assets. M&A deals involving unionized labor forces are a completely different animal than cookie cutter sale processes. Labor agreements are not black and white and practical implications of upsetting the unions are hard to predict. Our acquisition track record proves that we act opportunistically on deals. We execute and close value accretive transactions that benefit all stakeholders involved. The final proposal from Cliffs to acquire U.S. Steel included $27 in cash, $27 in CLF stock, and over $6 in synergy value to U.S. Steel stockholders, combining for a total value of over $60 per share. The industrial logic of a Cliffs U.S. Steel combination goes without saying. And that's the main reason we were willing to offer this value for the acquisition. There's no other buyer that can deliver $750 million in cost synergies. Our offer provided the best value and future upside for investors in the combined company. Our final proposal also included adequate remedies to mitigate antitrust regulatory risk and preserve a competitive market environment. Cleveland Cliffs offered a clear path to close the transaction, but rather than working towards a deal with Cliffs, U.S. Steel chose to announce a proposed sale of the company to a foreign buyer with serious conflicts of interest for America, no support or even awareness from the union, and for a lower overall value. U.S. Steel clearly overestimated the regulatory antitrust risk with Cliffs, completely ignored the union, and miscalculated the political risk with Nippon, given the negative implications to our supply chains and national security. 
So given all of this, what is Cleveland Cliffs planning to do about M&A and capital allocation going forward? We're going to do exactly what we always do. We're going to continue to be opportunistic on M&A. We're going to be buying back shares, and we're going to be paying down debt. In 2023, we generated more than $1.6 billion in free cash flow, nearly $500 million of which came in the fourth quarter alone. We actually generated more cash in 2023 than we did in 2022, when our adjusted EBITDA was higher. We used most of this free cash flow to pay down debt last year, bringing our net debt down by $1.3 billion year over year to only $2.9 billion as of the end of 2023, below our stated target of $3 billion. We have a balance sheet that can withstand volatility in the steel market, giving us flexibility to toggle capital allocation priorities as needed based on the opportunities in front of us. For now, we plan to be even more aggressive with share buybacks, given the discount presented in our stock. We still have over $600 million remaining in our existing share repurchase program, and depending on market and other conditions, we plan to deploy the remainder of this dry powder during open windows. And by the way, as of today, we have no MNPI, and we are free to trade and buy our stock as soon as the window opens tomorrow. With that said, we will also continue to reduce our net debt. Over the past two years, we have allocated roughly 85% of our free cash flow to debt repayment. During this period, debt reduction was our number one capital allocation priority, with share buybacks and M&A opportunities explored opportunistically. Going forward, share buybacks are now the number one priority. We have already paid off the entire balance of our ABL, this is a notable accomplishment that has brought our current liquidity above $4.5 billion, the highest level in our company's history. Our debt reduction will now be executed primarily via open market bond repurchases and redemptions. From an operational standpoint, 2023 was another blockbuster year for Cleveland Cliffs. We delivered record shipments, both in total and specifically to the automotive industry. We reduced costs by $80 per ton in 2023 and generated $1.9 billion in adjusted EBITDA. With the successful negotiation of our coal and alloy supply agreements, the purging of higher cost inventory in 2023, lower natural gas hedges, and continued healthy operating rates, we expect to achieve another $30 per ton in cost reductions in 2024, equating to roughly $500 million in EBITDA increase just from these cost reductions. In the fourth quarter of 2023, we generated adjusted EBITDA of $279 million, which we believe is the trough in quarterly adjusted EBITDA going forward. We reported our fourth consecutive quarter of shipments above 4 million tons, compared to 2022, in which all four quarters were below this level. We generated $487 million of free cash flow, affirming our prior commentary that working capital would be a meaningful source of cash for us in Q4. From an EPS standpoint, it's important to note that we reported both GAAP and adjusted EPS for Q4. The adjusted EPS figure backs out a small, one-time, non-cash goodwill impairment related to our non-core tooling and stamping business, previously known as Precision Partners, which was a small company that AK Steel had bought before we acquired them in 2020. Based on revised capital priorities and higher discount rates, we decided to write off the goodwill value related to those non-core assets, as we had foreshadowed in our 10K. Our capital expenditures in 2024 should remain at similar levels as 2023, with an expected outflow of $675 to $725 million for the full year. I would note that this is by far the lowest amongst our peers, with our equipment in very good shape and no plans to add any capacity. Our DDNA projection for 2024 is about $950 million, a decline from 2023. Our SGNA expense should be around $550 million, also a small decline from 2023. Furthermore, our automotive and other fixed contract pricing should remain in the same ballpark as 2023, which should actually promote some margin expansion due to our lower costs. Finally, 
you should note that we have uploaded an earnings presentation to our website for the benefit of our investors. While we don't plan to go through the slides during this call, we believe that you will find the materials to be a helpful reference to our financial highlights. Going forward, we plan to update this presentation each quarter for your convenience. With that, I will turn it over to Lorenzo. Thank you, Sosa, and uh, we, are, <clears throat> we welcome everyone to this call today. We are very pleased with what we were able to accomplish in 2023. Our total shipments of 16.4 million tons clearly demonstrated what our operations are now capable of. For reference, in 2021, which was our first full year under the current configuration, even with demand off the charts for basically the entire year, we only did 15.9 million tons of shipments. And that was with one more blast furnace operating than we have right now. I'm also proud of the successful implementation of the Cliffs H surcharge, which applies to the steel we produce through the BF BOF route using HBI as feedstock in the blast furnaces. This is actually the only true green steel premium that exists in the marketplace. With Cliffs H, we were able to implement a tangible way for us to be monetarily recognized for the real environmental gains and CO2 emissions reduction we have achieved over the last several years. With this success, we are pleased that we were able to hold our automotive pricing roughly steady into 2024, despite low priced competition in the marketplace. Going forward, we expect a lot of progress over the next decade with emphasis on hydrogen. We have deployed $10 million to build a hydrogen pipeline on site in preparation for the hydrogen hub to be built in Indiana with funding from the Department of Energy Hydrogen Initiative. The pipeline is ready, and late last week, we initiated our second blast furnace hydrogen injection trial. On Friday the 26th, we inject H2 gas for over an hour into the two years at our Indiana Harbor number no. seven blast furnace, the largest blast furnace in the Western Hemisphere, with great success. The trial resumed yesterday when we injected hydrogen at Indiana Harbor seven for most of the day. The trial continues today we are very excited with the positive results we have got so far on production, process control, quality of hot metal, and CO2 emissions. From the metallurgical standpoint, hydrogen as a blast furnace reductant works very well. Hydrogen is the real game-changing event in iron making and steel making. And that's our Cleveland Cliffs pathway for the production of green steel. We appreciate the partnership Cleveland Cliffs has with the Department of Energy, as well as with several other cabinet level offices. Due to the efforts of the Biden administration, and it's very important to emphasize that, bipartisan support in Congress, the United States is closer than anyone else to becoming the first country in the world to have abundant and competitively priced green hydrogen available to support a true green industrial revolution. We are also grateful for our partnership with our gas, gas supplier, Linde, in these efforts. Linde remains as committed to this technology as we are. Speaking of technology, American iron making and steel making technology is superior when compared to foreign steel makers. Case in point, the CO2 emissions intensity of cliffs, blast furnaces, and DOFs are 25% to 40% better than the emissions associated to steel produced through similar equipment in Japan, Korea, China, or Europe. 
said another way, none of the top 10 steel makers in the world have better CO2 emissions profile than Cleveland Clips. None. We are better than each one of them by a large margin. Our numbers are better because our technology is far ahead. Their so-called, quote, decarbonization strategies, unquote, are things we have been doing at Cliffs for a long time and have perfected. The use of our war pellets, natural gas utilization as reductant, HBI used as feedstock in blast furnaces, and now hydrogen injection. In the United States, the Cliffs brand is synonymous with technology innovation and quality steel. We are the benchmark, and the OEMs recognize that. Our technology got us our reputation, and we will continue to be on the cutting edge to ensure that this technological advantage stays with us. As for the broader market, we are, of course, pleased to see that each of our price increases announced over the last several months was successfully implemented after the market once again lost touch with reality in the August-September 2023 timeframe. The underlying basis to nearly all our strategic moves over the past decade has been the ongoing and inevitable increase in the tightness of ferrous scrap metal in the United States, particularly prime scrap. In 2023, the bushling scrap price averaged $490 per gross, gross ton, a number about $100 higher than the prior decade average. After owning our scrap company FPT for more than two years, it's now very clear to us that scrap is very valuable, particularly here in the United States. Keep in mind, the steel market in the United States is different from the rest of the entire world. Here, more than 70% of steel production uses EAFs, and therefore, a lot of scrap. Since we acquired FPT in November of 2021, we have been working to allow for the natural forces of supply and demand to prevail instead of settling for the power of an industry dominated by a couple mega buyers of scrap. A lot of the so-called cyclicality of the steel business in North America is self-inflicted and caused by the strange ways scrap is transacted. Once this serious issue is finally resolved, artificial seasonality will be eliminated and HRC prices can be stable for extended periods of time. Finally, as it's now public, we were prepared to deliver $60.50 per share of value for U.S. Steel well in excess of any other bidder and with a cash and stock structure that their major stockholders told us they prefer over an all-cash offer. Keep in mind, their major stockholders they are a Delaware company, are also our major shareholders. We are an Ohio company. And we speak with them very frequently. Unfortunately, we could not deliver the superior value to the West Steel stockholders because the West Steel board stood in the way and was hell-bent to sell to a foreign entity. And despite what is written in their proxy statement, based on our substantive analysis of the antitrust risk, we were fully confident in our strategy to clear any regulatory risks. We are truly disappointed for the U.S. Steel employees, particularly the unionized workforce. There is only one reason the USW exclusively backed Cleveland Cliffs and assigned to us the right to bid. It's our proven commitment to not just preserve, but to grow good American manufacturing jobs, good American middle-class jobs, 
and maintain American ownership of industries critical to our national security and to our supply chains. Fortunately for the workforce, we do not believe that the final chapter of this story has been written. It's now evident that the U.S. Steel Board of Directors made too severe miscalculations. They overrated the potential antitrust regulatory risk related to clips, and they completely underappreciated the risks related to the CFUS review and the USW Union contractual rights. We applaud the Biden administration for raising alarm bells on this proposed transaction. Along with influential elected officials at the Senate and at the House of Representatives on both sides of the aisle, the Biden administration has been very clearly expressing their views. We believe they rightfully see this transaction with Nippon as proposed being bad for America and bad for American workers. As we all know, it's hard to point out a single subject that can unify the positions and the opinions of Democrats and Republicans. At this moment in time, it would be seen as a miracle. Well, the enforced error made by the West Steel Board of Directors was able to promote this miracle. That's why we believe that the mistake will be fixed, hopefully earlier rather than later. From our part, we will continue to fight for our industry, for our company, our shareholders, and for the American workers. With that, I'll turn it over to Melissa for Q&A. Thank you. At this time, we'll be conducting a question and answer session. If you'd like to ask a question, please press star 1 on your telephone keypad. A confirmation tone will indicate your line is in the question queue. You may press star 2 if you'd like to remove your question from the queue. For participants using speaker equipment, it may be necessary to pick up your handset before pressing the star keys. Our first question comes from the line of Lucas Pipes with B. Riley Securities. Please proceed with your question. Thank you so much, operator. Good morning, everyone. Um, L L Lorenzo, to, to go back to your U.S. Steel uh, comments just a moment ago, I, I, I wanted to ask what, what, what gives you or gave you the confidence in, in the synergies while also potentially uh, having to meet divestiture requirements to clear antitrust? would really appreciate your perspective. Thank you. Yeah, we had a package. Uh, good morning, Lucas. Uh, we had a package uh, to be uh, that we... Uh, our attorneys at Dave Spoke were discussing with the attorneys at New Bank that we believe would be uh, uh, more than, than sufficient to clear all regulatory hurdles. And that included uh, the, the commitment to sell pellets to others, uh, the commitment to sell slabs to, to others, um, uh, other commitments on, on, on uh, uh, supply agreements, and uh, we would go all the way to some divestitures up to a level of $2 billion in revenues. That should do it, based on our own uh, homework done with, uh, the, the, with, with the, the, our knowledge of the, how the DOJ works, the antitrust division of the DOJ works, and uh, our deep experience uh, uh, led by Howard Chelensky of Dave Spock. Uh, unfortunately, we never had a, a willing partner, even though we were discussing in, in terms of uh, working together, uh, we never had a willing partner with Milbank. And by the way, for the record, the $7 billion uh, hurdle in revenues was never uh, uh, revealed to us. It was, it, it was an internal discussion of US, it was just an internal discussion. It was never discuss, even discussed with us. So. If they had brought that to the conversation, would uh, easily turn it down. So we are very, very uh, confident on what we had done and all the homework we did. We don't get the support we had uh, from the administration, from uh, polit uh, political uh, eminent people, political figures on the left, on the right, on the center, and uh, you know the names. And uh, if I need to say the names to clarify before they have to do it, and uh, that was totally ignored. So 
you you have absolutely you, you you harvest what you sow, and uh, at this point, uh, we'll see. Stay put. I, oh, I appreciate the comment. I forgot to, to talk about synergies. Yeah, you know how we operate with synergies. We usually we 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 under promise and over deliver. That is what happened with the K Steel. That's what happened when we acquired ArcelorMittal USA. So uh, we at this point with the US Steel would be more of the same, just on a bigger scale. So that would come from purchasing. That would come from. Uh, services background, healthcare, uh, renegotiations, all kinds of good stuff, stuff in terms of uh, having a bigger footprint and a lot more uh, uh, ability to negotiate and out, out of a, a, a much more uh, broad uh, type of uh, footprint. Uh, and uh, very importantly, our synergies were not uh, anticipating that we would shut down any facility and would not be letting go any single union employee, any single worker at the plants of West Steel or Cleveland Cliffs for that matter. So that would not be cutting jobs. So I'll leave it at that, but uh, uh, we, were, we had a robust proposal and uh, they elected to go in a different different direction. Good luck, like I said on December 18. Good luck on closing. Thank you. Thank you, Lorenzo. I, I um, appreciate that, that, that color. Um, in, in the meantime, um, many companies in, in the sector with strong cash flow have moved uh, towards a kind of a formulaic approach to capital returns, um, uh, allocating a percentage of available free cash flow to to buybacks for example you mentioned earlier um kind of buybacks debt reduction and opportunistic m a as as kind of three areas of, of capital allocation but i wondered if you uh, would be prepared to move towards um a percentage for example towards buybacks would appreciate your your color yeah. on this thank you look i know that's also answer that's one go ahead go ahead yeah hey lucas um so as i stated you know we've in, in, in the prior quarters, we've allocated about 85% of free cash flow to debt reduction. Um, what we're going to do going forward is we're going to be flexible. We're going to be a lot more aggressive with, with share buybacks. But you can sort of estimate that it will be sort of 50-50, um, you know, buybacks and debt reduction. Um, you know, and the reason that we're not putting in place a dividend at this point, for example, is because we want to remain flexible. Um, there are a lot of M&A opportunities available. Um, including the one that, that was announced uh, in December. We don't think that story is over yet. Um, so I think staying with this 50-50 split, it gives us enough flexibility to toggle, you know, the priorities uh, and be able to move quickly if opportunities present themselves. That's very helpful. I, I really appreciate the color and um, to you and the team at Cliffs. Uh, continue best of luck. Thanks, Lucas. Thanks, appreciate Lucas. it. Thank you. Our next question comes from the line of Tim Natanners with Wolf Research. Please proceed with your question. Hey, thank you. Good morning. Um, I wanted to just clarify if I could uh, some of the 2024 EBITDA color, um, or sorry, the guidance that you gave about how we can use that to arrive at forecasts. So you're talking about a little stronger volumes and I think $30 per ton of lower costs on a net basis. Um, and then on the pricing side, uh, obviously we could use the futures, we could have our own forecasts, but I was hoping for a little bit more color on the comment about why you think prices shouldn't go below a thousand given the futures market well below that. So just a little more color on making sure I have those numbers right on the futures, um, on the, on the outlook and also your thoughts on, on my comment on the thousand dollars. Uh, good morning, Tim. Uh, let me start with the futures. Uh, the futures are, uh, feature because uh, it's done by desks that uh, guys that uh, if I show them a hot rolled coil, a cold rolled coil, galvanized coil, normal spangle, they still cannot differentiate one from the other. And you know that. So they can go up and down 200, $250 per ton in a day. And uh, they do that with absolutely no consequences. So that's my opinion on futures. You basically, you can use that thing to 
uh, uh, as toilet paper. Uh, it's useless. That's, that, that's the future, because uh, we have a few producers of hot rolls in the country. We deal every day with the thing, and uh, we buy, we sell, we transact, we produce, and uh, we know a lot, more, a lot more about the future than the futures. So reset yourself, Tina. Unplug yourself from the, the wall. Plug again. They're going to be okay with pricing going forward. And then you're not going to be talking about uh, stomachedos and things like that. Because uh, I see potential on you. As far as the EBITDA guidance, $30 per, per, per ton is basically the $500 million of EBITDA that you're talking about. If you multiply 30 by, by 16.5 million tons of shipments, you get to 495. So I'm rounding up to 500. That's the number. Got it. Okay, that's helpful. Um, yeah, the futures market is tiny. I get it. It's just something people look at. So I just wanted to ask about that. Yeah. Just to clarify yeah, on the yeah, last. Yeah, yeah, yeah. People like yeah, me that? need to talk like I talk to make sure that uh, the people that look stop looking. Because if they stop looking, it's a good, good, good start, you know? And uh, if people like you help, life would be a lot easier because you're knowledgeable. You know that that thing sucks. You know that that thing is useless. You know that that thing is just a thing for people to sell uh, the, the, the newsletters every day. It's absolutely useless. There's a lot of uh, wealth being destroyed by the use of these things. It's about time for us as a, 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 a business community to understand that it's fair, it's fair to make money. But let's make money doing things that are constructive. And that thing is destructive. It's not constructive. I'm sorry I interrupted you. Go ahead, please, Tim. No, that's okay. I'll leave it there, Lorenzo. Thanks again. Thank you. Don't forget about the resetting thing. It's serious. Thank you. Our next question comes from the line of Tristan Grasser with BNP Paribas Exane. Please proceed with your question. Yes, hi. Good morning, and thank you for uh, taking um, my questions. Uh, the first question is on the scrap market. Uh, in your prepared remarks, you, you mentioned some artificial moves uh, in the scrap market and, and probably refer to, to the January settlement. So, so I would be keen to have your view on what you think happened and what do you think need to happen in the market to, to be what, what you call fair. That's my uh, first question. Thank you. Good morning, Tristan. Yeah, you already answered your, your own question. Yeah, that's the January thing. In a market that is clearly undersupplied with prime scrap. Why is undersupplied with prime scrap? Let's see. Manufacturing in the United States is uh, until the, the, the initiatives that are happening in the last few years, the IRA, the, 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 the infrastructure bill, and et cetera, all these things that are going uh, uh, on right now and they will bear fruit in the future, manufacturing is shrinking. With manufacturing shrinking, the generation of prime scrap is shrinking. At the same time, the mini mills continue to build capacity, and capacity to produce flat rolled steel with this prime scrap. There's no other way to get there, particularly with mini mills that don't own iron ore assets. So they can't use enough of uh, uh, metallics, enough of substitutes, so they have to use prime scrap. So. The prime scrap is shrinking because manufacturing is shrinking. It has, has not started to, to grow just yet. And the demand for scrap is uh, increasing. What's the, the, the trend of the price? It's up. So we can't have a drop like the one that was attempted to, to happen in January because it was just a, a head fake. The final numbers were not the initial numbers. The initial numbers were one trade, is one trade that only happens here in Ohio, and we have already identified how the trade goes. So, what's the solution? Just let supply and demand work. Because if supply and demand doesn't work, and this thing continues to happen time and time again, this is a country of laws. You cannot collude to make prices go in the direction you want. You're gonna have real competition. You're gonna have the forces of supply and demand prevail because that's what the, the, the letter of the law 
will support. I hope you understand my point. Yes, that's um, that's very clear. Thank you. Um, and, and my second question is on, on on the surcharge or the premium. I think you, you mentioned the successful uh, implementation uh, of the um, of the surcharge in the contracts. So, so what is the volume involved uh, for, for for those premiums, and what is it corresponding in terms of carbon intensity? Uh, I think you previously previously mentioned a forty dollar premium. Uh, and I believe you, you will move further down in carbon intensity for your BF, BOF. So do, do you believe this premium could increase with time or it should be relatively stable in 2024? Thank you. Yeah, in 2024, it will be stable. And that's the number. The, the surcharge is called Cliff's Edge. It's applied to all of our automotive clients at this point. And some of the clients outside of automotive that have the, the need and the desire to get uh, steel that is environmentally compliant. It's easy for them to not only pay for, but also to pass along, which they haven't started yet. But should be for a car, for example, assuming that a, a car has one ton of steel, it would be $40 per car. So it will not be significant in the big scheme of things. So uh, all of our automotive, uh, automotive contracts with multiple millions of tons, I call 5 million tons, is a significant number. So it's not irrelevant. That's why we're spending time discussing uh, in this call. Uh, the next step will be when we have green hydrogen available, which we don't have today. Our trials with hydrogen are being done with what we have, gray hydrogen. And gray hydrogen is good enough for us to make sure that metallurgically, inside the blast furnace, the hydrogen works as a reductant. And that's what we're proving right now. We are proving to ourselves that we are on the right track. We are very excited that we are on the technological uh, right track. But what we are aiming to have is green hydrogen. And when we have green hydrogen uh, available, we're going to be at the Cliffs H max level. In the meantime, any hydrogen, green, gray, pink, whatever, we can, we can get, get our hands around that we can use to enrich natural gas we are going to start using, and when we get to a level that we can consider that we are really reducing CO2 emissions due to the use of any type of hydrogen that is a positive for CO2 emissions, and we can prove the numbers to the world in our uh, 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 sustainability reports, we are going to go to the Cliffs H2 uh, uh, surcharge that will be higher than Cliffs H. So, in summary, Cliffs H now is $40 per ton. When we have in hydrogen in available enough to, uh, to uh, uh, use hydrogen to enrich natural gas, we're going to go to Cliffs H2. And when you get to green hydrogen, which we expect, we fully expect it to be in the next uh, several years, but before uh, 2030, we're going to be at the Cliffs H max. So, but that's the route we are going. But we are doing this to get paid not to brag about like 99.9% .9 of the CEOs that talk about environmental, they have, uh, they, they just want this thing to go away one day and they don't need to talk about it anymore, but they don't even know what they're talking about. All right, that's, uh, that's very clear. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. As a reminder, if you'd like to join the question queue, please press star one on your telephone keypad. Our next question comes from the line of Bill Peterson with J.P. Morgan. Please proceed with your question. Yeah, hi. Uh, good morning, and thanks for taking our questions. Uh, first question, I wanted to kind of come back to the fundamentals and, and, you know, your outlook. So if you think, you know, the current view of the steel market, as you see it, given that it looks like pricing may may have already peaked this year compared to last year, which was a little bit later in the, in the year, uh, you know, maybe March, April. And then, you know, if you can touch on the customer inventory you're seeing, relative strength, and the value added steel products over HRC. And then specific for you, as we think about the first quarter, what, how, sh how should we think about the product mix, you know, given the step down in coded volumes during the fourth quarter? Yeah, look, uh, uh, good morning, Bill. Uh, look, uh, the, the, first of all, uh, we are seeing a first quarter that is pretty stable in comparison with what we were seeing last year. Remember, last year, everybody was expecting the hard landing expecting the, the Armageddon, the catastrophe, and uh, 
inflation would take over, the world would come to an end, and all of a sudden, everything was was great. Everything was uh, okay, and uh, we we were fine in terms of a uh, soft landing. Uh, the other thing that influenced last year was not even the the strike uh, that the UAW called on the big tree in Detroit, the big tree car manufacturers in Detroit, because that was actually a good thing for us as a supplier, a major supplier of automotive, to the point that the car manufacturers were building inventories in anticipation of the strike, and then when the strike was not as as bad or as long as they were anticipating, they continued by. So we were very uh, mildly affected, only at the very tail end of the strike, when the strike was in, the, in, the, in, in their last days. But the biggest impact of the UAW strike was the, 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 the behavior of the other buyers, particularly the middlemen, particularly the service centers and distributors, that in anticipation of a, of a, 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 a disaster that they were, they were expecting on, on demand and prices, they stop the buying. And then when an entire sector goes uh, black, doesn't, the, 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 an entire sector does not buy anymore, prices go down. And that's what happened last year. We are not anticipating, Bill, at this point, that nothing like that will happen this year. So we are expecting, at the end of the day, a much more stable, a much more normal year in 2024 and that's why we are basically anticipating a flat year in terms of shipment. 16.4 million tons last year, 16.5 million tons this year, no change in mix. Yeah, and this for the first quarter, how should we think about mix, your own mix? I'm sorry, Bill, you know, say one more time? Yeah, just the second part of my question was how to think about the product mix for, for your business in the first quarter, given the step down in coded volumes in the last quarter. Yeah, go ahead, Celso. Yeah, hey, Bill, it's Celso. Um, some general talking points on the first quarter. In terms of mix, you know, you should see a similar mix uh, in Q1 relative to Q4. From a shipment standpoint, Q1 should be, a, you know, a slight increase from Q4. Um, and then from a, an average selling price standpoint, you can probably plug uh, around $60 a ton uh, increase um, as we start to see, you know, benefit from, you know, lags on index pricing and things like that. Um, and then in terms of costs, uh, you know, we, we're going to have a big benefit from um, lower raw materials and coal, but that's not going to hit until Q2. Um, so those are kind of the general, uh, you know, estimates for Q1 that you can think about. That's, a, that's helpful color. Um, and for my second question, and look, I realize your views on the on NSC, you know, U.S. deal is clear, but but should the deal go through, and realize the current plan is to return capital to sharehold, uh, return capital to shareholders as well as debt pay down, but would you see the need to bolster your footprint or or improve your technical capabilities in order to compete moving forward? And if so, I guess what kind of assets would Cliffs, you know, maybe look to acquire, um, anything downstream for the electric deal, something else? Look, uh, we don't see the need to, to do anything. We believe that we have a fantastic footprint. We have a fantastic position in terms of uh, our, our feedstock and our, our ability to control our own destiny. So we don't see the need to do anything. But we continue, Bill, to see opportunities. Technologically, we are ahead. In terms of quality, we are ahead. But don't forget, we built a steel company in three years with debt, and we paid the debt down to a point that nobody would anticipate. It's like buy a big house with a big mortgage, 30 years, and everybody would be happy to keep paying every month for 30 years, and then in three years, you're done. You paid off the mortgage. That's what we did here. And investors need to recognize that. We, when we see a target, that is completely underappreciated, like West Steel. West Steel is trading on the, based on the cash on hand. Everybody, someone else, was believing that they could do a better job than that management team that is squattering there. And I agree with them. That's why I made an offer to bring them to the, 
to, to the to the to the role, role of uh, of companies that trade based on some type of fundamentals and not just on cash on hand. And then my first offer was a good one, but then things got crazy because uh, that board did not want to sell to Cliff Spirit full stop. They would like to break the back of the union. That's what they are doing. Let's talk turkey here. That management team and that board had one goal in mind, and the goal was to break the back of the United Steel Workers. And by breaking the back of the United Steel Workers, to break the back of the unionized labor in America, I am a big supporter of unionized labor because it goes against bosses like Dave Burt. These type of people need to go. So that's my, my, my take on U.S. Steel. Do I need to give you more color, or that's enough? No, no, that's good. And it's clear that uh, yeah, you know you're you know you have the what you take you have what you need to compete. So I appreciate uh, the, the insights here, and uh, you know, uh, good luck uh, in 2024 and the execution ahead. Thank you. Our next question comes from the line of Alex Hacking with Citi. Please proceed with your question. Yeah, morning, Lorenzo Celso. I just have hey, one Alex. question. Hey, hey, how are you? Um, on the thirty dollars a ton cost guidance, what volume do you realistically need to achieve that? All right, you're guiding to sixteen and a half million tons. Could you achieve that level of cost reduction at sixteen million tons? Any color there on that relationship would be helpful. Thank you. Yeah, I mean that's what we're assuming, Alex. We're um, like we said, you know, we're at sixteen point four last year. We're going to be at sixteen and a half this year. Um, that's what we need to continue to lower our costs. We've done a lot of cost reduction of, over the you know, last few quarters, uh, but there's still a little bit more to go, um, and, and that's what we're sticking with. We're confident in achieving that, uh, that cost reduction during the whole year. It's not necessarily going to come you know, next quarter, but it's gonna, you're going to see that throughout the year given the, the volume uh, assumptions that we have. Okay, just but if volume, let's say, was 16 million tons instead, would you be able to achieve any per ton cost reductions, or we would see costs more flattish in that kind of scenario? Yeah. So with with lower volume, you know, there are things that we could toggle. We probably have, you know, less maintenance expense and things like that. So that would offset the volume impact. Okay. Thanks. Appreciate yep. it. No problem. Thank you. Thank you. Our next question is a follow up from the line of Lucas Pipes with B. Riley Securities. Please proceed with your question. Thank you very much, operator. Thank you very much for taking the follow-up question. I, I wanted to ask uh, first on the, on, the, on the fixed pricing and how, um, how that uh, was shaping up uh, for the January contracts kind of on a year-on-year basis, and then also if you could share any expectation uh, for the April tranche. Thank you very much. Yeah, the, 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 the last price increase, we are transacting uh, at the level that we announced for in some cases. And uh, the overall market is still below, so it, it's a mixed bag. So we always uh, try one more until we realize that the market uh, has uh, reached a point that we are not going to be able to push anymore. We like higher prices. That's all the best thing for our our companies, the best thing for our employees, the best thing for our shareholders. So that's why we push prices up. We go until we can't go no more. On the other hand, we don't see any reason for prices to be, HRC price to be below 1,000 in this marketplace at this very point. With all the fundamentals being, you go around and around and around and you come back to one thing, scrap. So I know I have already discussed scrap enough. So. $1,000 per ton is a good floor, and uh, I would say that at this point, the 1150 is my, my, my talk. So that's the range that I expect prices to transact as far as HRC going forward. As far as the, the, the automotive uh, uh, block uh, in, in, that uh, goes in April, uh, the biggest uh, client on that block is Toyota. Toyota is uh, an April 1st uh, for us. And uh, we have a great relationship with Toyota. Uh, we, uh, they are our largest client in automotive at this point by a, a, a decent margin against the other that we used to be called Big Tree. Uh, they are still big, but uh, uh, Toyota is bigger. 
And uh, the good thing about Toyota, we continue to develop uh, highly sophisticated specs with Toyota, particularly at this point in no oriented electrical steels, uh, because we really produce no oriented electrical steels. We don't just say that we are producing no oriented electrical steels. And we never sue Toyota like uh, Nippon Steel just did in Japan. Uh, Nippon Steel sued Toyota for, to get a price increase. We're getting price increase without suing our clients. So if that's the technology that they would like to bring to the United States, we don't need that technology. We know how relationships work. Thank you very much. Um, and, and in light of the strong volume guidance, what's what's a good ratio to use for kind of fixed pricing versus um, more spot exposed? Thank you. 50-50 is a good number. We are probably in the 45-55, so we're close to the 50-50. I don't know if Celso has any more color on that. No, I think that, yeah, that's a good way to think about it. Thank you. And then um, going, going back to the market dynamics, and I appreciate the the points on the on the scrap side. When when I do the math on um, imported steel into the U.S., I, I arrive at a kind of landed price of um, 1150, uh, which which is obviously higher than uh, where U.S. HRC is quoted by the major um, publishing houses. How, how how do you square that, or um, how how would you frame up the competition from imports today? Thank you. I'm sorry, if I, I'm not sure if I understood your question, Lucas. Um, when, when I do the math, I, I arrive at a, a import price. So if you if you if 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 someone were to buy steel from abroad today, it's it's at a price that's that's higher than where I see the U.S. HRC price, and uh, that that on the surface um, makes little sense given the import requirement, given that the U.S. is still short steel. So. I wondered if you have a view on that and where imports currently kind of factor into the price discovery. Yeah, the biggest thing when we're talking about steel coming from, from abroad is that, first of all, steel coming from abroad is by and large steel coming from blast furnace BOF, integrated type of mills. The mini mill thing only exists in volume and, and in importance in the United States. So when you talk about big uh, producers of steel that are able to export competitors from China or Korea or Japan or Europe, they are super influenced by the price of iron ore. So the, the old IODEX that we used to discuss a lot in these calls uh, a few years ago is now above 130 bucks. I remember one of my last calls when iron ore was still important. For us, I said, IODEX should should trade no lower than 130, something like that. Bingo. That's exactly, several years later, that's exactly where we are. So I'm making the same prediction for Hot Road Coil today. And uh, we continue to be very attentive to the trade laws of the United States and the, the enforcement of the trade laws of the United States. Because when things don't go the way I have just described, the reason is very simple. It's dumping. And the biggest problem of having foreign ownership in the United States is that you put the, 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 uh, you put the fox to take care of the hen house. And then we're going to have a domestic player that will say, no, I don't think that there's a problem here. And he's a domestic player. So we cannot allow that to happen because that would be in weakening the, 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 the trade laws from the inside. If you can't enforce, having the trade laws doesn't work. So that's one of the things why we are so protected in terms of our supply chains and our national security. Because of course it's not in the best interest of the country to give away control over these things, particularly steel production, in times of war or pre-war that we are in right now. Lorenzo, I really appreciate the color. Uh, again, to you and your team, best of luck. Thank you, Lucas. Thank you. That concludes our question and answer session. I'll turn the floor back to Mr. Gonzalez for final comments. Thank you very much for participating in the call today. Great questions. Uh, we, uh, we believe that the saga is not over, but for us, 
we are going to continue to play as we go. Uh, in the next 24 hours, the, the window for us will be open, and you make no mistake, my priority at this point is buying back my shares because my shares are on sale. So, and I, I like to buy things on sale. Thank you very much and have a great day. Thank you. This concludes today's conference call. You may disconnect your lines at this time. Thank you for your participation.